So you remember I, I told you guys I had three or four hours of material to get in two hours? Um, I got handed all these questions, so we, we got six hours. <laughs> no, in, in all seriousness, I am going to go ahead right this minute, take a few minutes to very quickly answer some of these, because uh, more than likely some of you guys are having the same questions, and, you know, to me this is kind of fun. This is when you get to... Uh, to figure out what you came here and had questions about. Somebody asked the question, what killed off the dinosaurs? Um, I actually had this literally next in my slide, but the clock was sitting there screaming at me to shut up. So let's real quickly pick it up. The, what your kids are going to be told is that asteroid, right? They're going to be told. But that asteroid really, to me, creates more questions than it does answers. Because how do you selectively kill stuff on the other side of the planet from an asteroid or meteor that hits on this side? Um, I brought with me five, there's 27 to 28 scientific reasons they say that killed the dinosaurs, asteroid being the first one. Number two, an exploding star flooded the earth with intense radiation resulted in fatal mutation for dinosaur offspring. Number three, the Earth's climate became too warm, too cold, too dry, or too wet for the dinosaur's health. Number four, change in the dinosaur's diet resulted in weakened eggshells that broke after being laid. Sad to say, number five really is a scientific theory, and that is a laxative plant in the dinosaur's diet disappeared, and they all died of constipation. <laughs> I'll let you decide if that one's possible, probable, or pitiful. At the end of the day, let me share with you what I know and don't know. We don't know precisely. Um, I do know this. I know they were thriving pre-flood. I think in that paradise type environment, vegetation, they were thriving. I told you guys, everything was vegetarian. Genesis 1, 29 and 30, right? After the flood, if you look in Genesis 9 verse 3, God basically says, Fire up the barbecue, okay? That is when he gives man the ability to eat meat. So I think two things got him. Number one, change in climate after the flood. Because it didn't just rain. It quite literally changed topography. Uh, I'm going to talk here in just a second about Pangea. Probably talk a little bit about the Ice Age real quick. Bottom line is... It changed dramatically the earth. We're now in a fallen world, right? Number two, what has man always done to animals we fear? We hunt them, we kill them. Um, the, the third thing that I'll, I'll throw out to you to let you chew on and just think about. What is the only animal that grows throughout its lifespan? Reptiles. All other animals... We have a growth period, and then we plateau. Like humans, we grow from like 13 to 20. We stop growing, and we shrink at the end, right? Not so with reptile. Reptile, as long as it is growing, breathing, eating, it continues to grow. Now, you take that scientific fact. By the way, dinosaurs were considered reptile. You take that fact, and you add it to how long were people living prior to the flood? Let's see, Adam 930, Methuselah 960. You take a Komodo dragon, and you let that guy live 900 years. Anybody think he could get kind of big? Yeah. Uh, another question, and I apologize, I'm going to have to kind of jump around on different PowerPoints. Somebody asked a question about, all right, what about feathered dinosaurs? Um, because basically that's one of the things that they try really, really hard to push upon our kids is this idea that, hey, um, dinosaurs evolved into birds, which I guess if you eat chicken nuggets shaped like dinosaurs, you're supporting that. <laughs> so Archaeopteryx is kind of their, their missing link, so to speak. They would say that this guy basically is proving that. And here on the Wendy's bag, I love this. Fact, new findings show that birds are probably related to dinosaurs. Probably, but that's a fact. <laughs> if you look on this, this is a, uh, a Darwin exhibit at the St. Louis Zoo. 
And they've got this picture right here. This is their alleged missing link, uh, the Archeop or Archaeopteryx fossil. Problem with it is this. Research has shown that birds lack the embryonic thumb that dinosaurs had, suggesting it's impossible for the species to be closely related. Add to that, how many of you have ever seen a scather? Which would be the in-between scales and feathers. Mm, they don't really exist. A bigger problem is this guy right here. So 1999, there was a major, hey, this is a big deal. They called it feathers for T-Rex. They call this guy Archaeoraptor. And they say this is the missing link. In fact, new bird-like fossils are missing links in dinosaur evolution. They named this guy, they started putting him in museums, only to later discover what they actually had was the front half of a dinosaur and the back half of a bird. A Chinese farmer had taken two fossils, cement pasted them together so well it fooled researchers until they actually used an MRI and realized, hey, this is not the same composite. These are two different fossils. Now, I know right now you're thinking, oh, that Chinese farmer shouldn't have done that. And you're right, he shouldn't have. But he made more in a day selling that one fossil than he'd make the rest of his life <laughs> to some very unsuspecting folks. Do I think that birds evolve from, no, first off, think about this. How do you evolve bones that have holes in them that are, are hollow from a dinosaur? Because birds, we know, have to be lighter weight. Their bones aren't full. Also, birds have a unidirectional heart. Most all other animals don't. Uh, feathers is a problem. How do you evolve flight? You know, how do you go from an animal that's got little arms like this to wings? Because mutations, as they always want to say, don't give you more material. So, um, how about this one? God made male and female at the beginning. How does evolution say males and females evolved? Great question they don't have an answer for. For all the high school and college students in this room, here's what you're being told. That originally we started out with these one-celled amoeba-like things that reproduced asexually. And here's what that means. That means they woke up one day and said, oh, I want a friend. Bloop. Okay, and so now there's two. Supposedly, because we needed more, and this is their key term, genetic diversity, we evolved sexual reproduction. So we went from, boop, to males and females. But think about this for just a minute. Here's what that means. That means you've got to go, boop, and while you're doing, boop, you're also now evolving all the internal and external organs needed, all the hormones needed, all the nerves, muscles needed in both a male and a female. You also have to be evolving these at the same time, in the same location, and they got to like each other. No, it ain't happening. Um, when, you, when you stop and really think about Things like uh, lactation. When you think about all the different ways that God created men and women to be able to have a child, take care of the child, it is it's mind-blowing. From an anatomical perspective, that doesn't happen by chance. They can't explain how do you get a separate male and female. What they do is they show our kids these beautiful pictures of an evolutionary tree of life and it, you know, down here it's got a single cell something and then a dog over here and a monkey and a man and, but you notice in those pictures there's always only one of each thing on each branch when you would have to have two. They can't explain males and females. Um, I was about to share something with you. I'm not going to because it's not inappropriate, but it was a conversation with a college professor where we talked about something that if y'all really want to know, email me, I'll share it with you. 
Um, I'm wondering about your thoughts on God's sense of time as related to uh, Psalm 90, verse 4, 2 Peter 3, 8, day is like a thousand years, thousand years like a day. Um, so this is why I don't believe in evolution. Um, I'm, not I'm not convinced that a day to God is always 24 hour period. So let's first start out with this. Does 2 Peter 3, 8 say a day like the Lord is like a thousand years? Absolutely. Is he talking about creation there? No. <laughs> what he's actually talking about there, they were getting impatient. They want to know, when's he coming back? And he says, look, God doesn't measure time the way you do. God is actually outside of time. He's eternal. Day to him is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. So for you to rip that verse out and carry it over here and drop it into the creation count, there's some big problems with that. First big problem, the word there for day same word that's talked about in the account of Jonah and the big fish, Jesus in a tomb. How many of you want to put Jonah inside the belly of a big fish for 3,000 years? No, no. I mean, can you imagine what he smelled like? That would not be good, right? How many of you want to put Christ in the tomb? No, we, we, don't, we definitely don't want to mess with that, right? It's interesting to me. We don't want to mess with Christ and resurrection. We don't really want to mess with Jonah. But we got to figure out how to stretch out time over here, right? No. What he's talking about there is God doesn't measure time the way we do. Day to him is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day because he's eternal. He's outside of time. It's not talking about the creation account. So then the question would be, all right, if God was directing Moses and wanted to, to tell us how long it took to make creation, could, could, he, could he tell us that? Like, could he say, for in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them? Yeah, Exodus 20, verse 11. That's how he said it. Doesn't get a whole lot easier than that. Um, let's see. All right, we dealt with feathers. We dealt with that. What about the idea of Pangea? So, I actually, I also had somebody come up and talk to me about that. Pangea, I always have to tell the older people that's not the bread company. Okay, that's Panera. Pangea, your kids know, is the idea that everything used to be together, like one big supercontinent, right? And what they do is they teach this idea that over a long period of time, all the continents broke apart, separated. Here's the thing. I actually don't have a problem with Pangea. I actually kind of think things were a lot closer together. And I think it was at the flood that he ripped them apart. If you look at Genesis chapter 7, about a verse 11, um, he talks about not just rain coming from above. He talks about the fountains of the great deep were torn apart. Sound like he's tearing apart tectonic plates, right? The problem I have is they teach, they show a picture of like South America and Africa, right? They fit pretty good together. And they'll say something like this. Those two continents today are moving, uh, I think it's like 33 millimeters apart a year, or some very, very small fractional amount. And so they extrapolate and say, okay, in order for it to have moved this distance, it had to take gazillions of years. What are they doing? They're assuming a very slow rate of separation, right? Is it possible that God could have ripped it apart at a flood, everything shifted during the flood, and now we're seeing things settle into place? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, all right, we got that one. Can you speak to the role of fathers and the correlation between young men who grow up to pursue homosexuality and transgenderism due to the lack of fatherly influence and love. Um, that's my passion. So I'm going to run down here and grab a throat thing because when I speak this long, if I don't have one of these in my mouth, I start getting kind of squeaky. So fathers, I think, for too long have basically gotten off the hook in the church and we have done a good job of sitting in the pews but we have done a horrible job of being spiritual leaders in the home and if I were going to do another series here like if the elders call me and say hey we want you back 
I would try to twist their arm into allowing me to speak on family and, and things like fathers being leaders, what are the roles in the home, those kinds of things, because here's what I know. All this stuff we're talking about matters. But if moms and dads aren't getting this into the heart of their kids in their home, doesn't matter. It's got to happen in your home. And the dads in this room have to take a role for that. I can show you the statistics. In fact, I'll bring it up very quickly. What happens when you take a dad out of the home? Think about things like dropping out of school, uh, getting put in jail, those kinds of things. There's a reason why when you take a dad out of the home, all of that stuff goes up. Give me just a second here. Here we go. Right here. Which, by the way, um, I'll, I'll start with this slide. So, out of, out of wedlock births, you know what the current number is? Like, if I updated my graph, 43% of all children born in the United States go home to one parent. 43%. This is why fathers matter right here. 63% of young people who kill themselves coming from homes without a dad. 71% of high school dropouts coming from homes without a dad. 85% of the youth in prison right now coming from homes without a dad. I was speaking here in Texas one time. I had two guys come up to me after my lesson. I'd done a, a whole series on some of the consequences. And I was going through this material and they came up and they said, um, sir, you your information's wrong. Now, I've been doing this long enough to know God wants me to have a humble heart. And he's humbled me a couple times, okay? And so my initial reaction was, okay, help, help me understand. Tell me, tell me what I got wrong. Even though in the back of my mind, I was kind of like, I knew I did my research. And they looked at me and they said, we work in the prison. That number is probably higher than that. 90% of homeless, runaway kids coming from homes without a dad. So, um, do I think it's a big deal? Absolutely. Let's real quickly deal with carbon-14, because I had at least one question in that area. And here we go. All right, here are the seven assumptions that all have to be right in order for carbon-14 dating to be right. Um, the question is, do you know of any tests or studies in carbon-14 that have been done on dinosaur bones? And we talked a little bit about you got to have a living standard. The way carbon-14 works is, let me back up. Right there. What they believe is every 5,730 years, you lose half of the radioactive carbon in that fossil. And so every 5,730 years, it's cut in half and cut in half again, cut in half again. First off, we don't know if that's the true half-life because nobody's lived 5,730 years. Second, we don't know how many artifacts have been introduced to that. Third, you have to have a living sample to know how much is this lost. And we don't have that in this particular case. I will throw up on the screen very quickly a couple of, uh, these are peer-reviewed studies. A living mollusk was tested, carbon-14, dated as being 3,000 years old, keyword there being living. Freshly killed seals dated at 1,300 years. Mummified seals dead only 30 years of given ages as high as 4,600. I love this one. Muscle tissue from beneath the scalp of an ox was dated at 24,000 years old. Hair from the hind limb of the same animal 
dated at 7,200 years, which I figured this one out. He got a toupee. <laughs> um, how do you answer the question, where did God come from? Atheists always ask this question. And the reason they always ask this question, Richard Dawkins is really, he loves to beat people over the head. This is kind of like his billy club. Okay, then where did God come from? And the reason is because Richard Dawkins can't grasp, he doesn't understand or comprehend eternality. God is not on a linear time scale. God is outside of that linear time scale, has always been and will always be. He's eternal. And the reason we know that something has to be eternal is because something had to give rise to all the matter here. And that something was God. And so when I talk to them, I make sure they understand the concept of eternality. Uh, one or two more and then I'll move on. Here we go. What about Cain's wife? Where did she come from? And let me just drop this up there real quick. So if you've got a Bible, look at Genesis chapter 4. About verse 50, 16. Um, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore Enoch. So you remember Cain and Abel. Abel gets killed. God punishes Cain, says, you're going to have to leave. He leaves, and all of a sudden he's got a wife. Where did the, the wife come from? Let's look at three possibilities. Possibility number one. Could God have, if he'd wanted, taken groups of people, put them all over this earth, Cain wandered into one of those group of people, found a wife, married her, lived happily ever after. That's option one. Option number two. Genesis chapter 5, verse 4. It says Adam and Eve had other children after Seth. So could Cain have married his niece? Like waited until his brothers and sisters got married, had children, and married a niece. Or option number three. Could he have simply married his sister? Now let's look at each one of those real quickly. Option number one, hopefully you notice how careful I was in phrasing that first one. I said, could God have if he'd wanted? Folks, God could do anything. He's God. But he told us how he did do it, right? In fact, Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother, does it say, of some of the living? All living. Meaning all the lineage of humanity is coming through who? Coming through Eve. Option number one, unscriptural. I got to get rid of it. All right, what about option number two? That one's a little harder. Try as hard as I can, I can neither prove nor disprove that one. Okay? It will forever remain a possibility. But I think given the amount of time he would have to wait for younger brothers and sisters to grow of age, get married, have kids, offspring to then grow of age, I think the best option is option number three. He married his sister. Now, if you were to go to the high school classroom tomorrow morning and suggest that to all the high school students, hey, uh, how about marrying your sibling? You're going to get this. Oh, sick. I can't imagine somebody else ending up with my sibling. We start hearing words like incest. And, but let me remind you, this was before any kind of genetic mutations existed. And God's command was, be fruitful and multiply. So, good questions. I appreciate it very much. I know I've got a few more up here, and like they said, I will uh, I will email you guys. I do want us to touch on this last topic before our time runs out, because I think this is one of the most important. And I'm I'm going to go kind of fast. This is a. Uh, uh, a combination lesson that, that a, another preacher put together, I put together, actually probably three or four preachers that I've heard put together. So um, to me, this is probably the most important question. Why do I choose to believe the Bible? As a scientist, why do I choose to believe the Bible? Now, I know some of you may be thinking, wait, time out, Brad, hold up. There, there are other questions out there like, how about, is baptism necessary? 
or what must I do to be saved? Now, I want you to think, though, after you've answered that particular question, so let's, let's talk about baptism. I had a guy in Jamaica last week that he and I were sitting down studying about whether baptism was necessary. Once I've answered his question using the Bible, I still got to go back and explain why the Bible is my source for authority, right? And so ultimately at some point, I got to get to the question of why the Bible and not the Book of Mormon or the Quran or some other book. And so understand it's okay when people ask us questions, right? It's not a crime to question Christianity. I've told a lot of people, basically, the Bible has stood up for 2,000 years without your help. <laughs> It'll stand up another 2,000 years if it needs to. It's okay. God did not call us to a blind faith. And so, I want you to think, if somebody asks you right now, why do, why do you choose to believe the Bible? What would you say? I'm going to take you inside a freshman say a, a biology classroom or a philosophy classroom where you got a professor his job he thinks his job is to expand your mind so much that your brains fall out in fact he wants to deprogram you of any christianity and so maybe you or, or your child is sitting in his class and he starts out by saying all humans evolve from apes and before you even know what's going on your hands up. You're like, I don't, I don't believe that. And he says, based on what authority? And you start out saying, well, you know, the Bible says in Genesis 1, and at this point, this guy, inwardly, he is smiling. He hopes he's got one of these in his class this year. Oh, so you believe the Bible. Okay. <laughs> well, why not some other authority? In fact, why are you even sitting here? Now, this first answer I'm giving you right here, please, please, please do not ever use this answer, okay? Well, that's how I was raised. <laughs> Don't do that, okay? I mean, think about that. Every human on the planet, whether they're Muslim, atheist, Christian, everybody can say that, right? Well, that's how I was, that's how the Mormon was raised. That's how the Muslim was raised. That's Okay, so you're saying that's how you were raised, and yet you're on a college campus paying me money? Apparently, your Bible doesn't hold all authority. Not just that, if the Bible is capable of giving you what you need, why do you need me? And then he turns it and makes it personal and says, uh, what about your parents? Haven't you learned things in which your parents were wrong? And let's be honest, by 18... There have been a few times, you know, like, like that time where, you know, your mom told you, hey, put on a hat so you don't catch a cold. And yet by age 18, you realize a cold is a virus. You don't catch it through your head, right? Or how about this one? Don't make your eyes do that or they'll stay like that. Well, no, they won't. <laughs> and, and by age 18, you know that. So please, whatever you do, don't use the because that's how I was raised that's that's no good now the second bad answer in this age of experience and feelings everybody's like oh your experience trumps everything and so a young lady says well I believe the Bible because it changed my life and that professor says oh really yeah, well, let, let, me, let me tell you about another young man had his life changed. And, and maybe he starts to tell you about a guy who mother had mental illness, father killed. He ended up going to live with his sister in New England and fell into the wrong crowd, ended up in prison. Eventually had some men come visit him in his cell and said, look, you need to you need to humble yourself, bow your knee. He wouldn't do it until one day he had a vivid experience in his cell. Changed his life, radically changed his life. He went from being just a, a, a regular thug to a model prisoner overnight. Got released early for good behavior. Started churches all across this country. There are streets 
In fact, probably in Austin, named after this guy, his name, Malcolm X. His Messiah was Mohammed. Now, let me tell you the rest of the story. By the end of his life, he realized his experience was wrong. He disavowed the nation of Islam, and they ended up killing him. But follow me. Here's a guy who, he experienced something. It changed his life. And by the end of his life, he knew it was wrong. Or how about the, the young lady that says, well, you know, I, I, I believe the Bible because it works for me. <laughs> you see any logical problems with that one? Uh, yeah, big enough to drive a truck through. Just think about it for just a minute. If just because something works for you, does that make it true? No. Think about the alcoholic, okay? It's taking the 12-step program. Somewhere around steps two or three in AA, you're supposed to acknowledge a higher power. Well, this guy doesn't believe in a God. So here's what he does. For grins and giggles, he decides that that flashing neon light outside of his window is his higher power. He'd been sober for two years. He's tried it. It works for him. So according to your logic, that neon sign has as much authority and power as your God. Folks, the Bible is not true because it works for us. It works for us because it's what? It's true. So what's the answer? If you've got a Bible, let me encourage you to open it up to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I want to give you the answer that I hope your kids, your grandkids will use if they're ever in front of a professor. He says, why the Bible? Think about what they would say if, if your child said this. I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies, claim their writings are divine rather than human in origin. That, that's a little bit better than saying, yeah, that's how I was raised. Let me share with you where that's derived from, and then we're going to go by it piece by piece. Again, take a look, 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables. When we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed, as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And when you read that, it sounds an awful lot like Peter is defending a belief in the Bible. So let's look at this answer for just a moment. Brad, why do you choose to believe the Bible? I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents. Say that with me. It's a reliable collection of historical documents. Oh, y'all can do better than that. It's a reliable collection of historical documents. 2 Peter 2 verse 1, or 1 verse 16, we did not follow cunningly devised fables. These aren't myths. In fact, this is a book that was written down over 15 to 1600 years. Three different continents. Three different languages. Forty or so authors. You know, it, it didn't like some guy went by himself into a cave and said, oh, I got a revelation. Which, by the way, if you know anything about the Book of Mormon... And the Quran, ah, kind of similar. One guy goes into a cave, gets a revelation. Not the Bible. It is a reliable collection of historical documents. Notice the next part. 
written down by what? Eyewitnesses. Is eyewitness testimony a good thing? Yeah, let's say you get out here on I-35, you get hit by somebody. I know, I know in Texas everybody drives really gently and kind. <laughs> yeah, right. Imagine somebody hits you. But when the cop gets there, they're saying, no, 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 no. He hit me. But you've got three witnesses that saw the guy on the phone, not paying attention. He hit you. Is eyewitness testimony good? Oh, yeah. Peter put it this way. He said, we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Flip over to 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Let me, let me share with you a little passage here. Just see if, if this kind of resonates with you. 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. He goes on to say, Verse 2, life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you. Sounds like he's trying to get to something, doesn't it? Maybe verse 3 are kind of cleared up. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. We've seen it. We've heard it. So Brad, why do you believe the Bible? I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses, notice the next part, during the lifetime of what? Other eyewitnesses. Huh. You know what that means? That, that means the Bible is falsifiable. And here's what I mean by that. That means there were people living... When the Bible was written, that if, say, Paul had gotten it wrong, they could say, um, that's not how it happened. In fact, flip over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. By the way, I love this chapter. If you ever need a good definition of the gospel, here you go. I delivered to you first of all, verse 3. That which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He was seen by Cephas, or Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, by all the apostles. Last of all, he was seen by me also, as one born out of due time. Take a look at what he's saying. The part that I highlighted, underlined, of whom the greater part remained. Do you realize when Paul wrote this, there were more than 250 of them still alive? They were still alive. Had he been lying, didn't get it right, all they had to say was, um, that, that's not how it happened. In fact, look over, flip back with me to Acts chapter 2, verse 32. Acts chapter 2, we go to a lot of times, we talk about Peter preaching this first gospel sermon. You got all these people who their hearts were pricked. But notice in verse 32, after he gets done addressing them, telling them what they've done, verse 32, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all what? Witnesses. Huh. Huh. I wonder how many people were there to be witnesses. Well, let's say about 3,000 of them were baptized that day, right? So he says something like this. Yeah, but, you know, how, how can you trust the, the Bible? It's been translated too many times. And so then maybe he says something like this. You, you know that game of telephone where, like, I tell somebody over here, and they start passing it around. By the time he gets over here, does this sound anything like I started? Well, folks, a professor that says something like that is either evil, ignorant, or both. Okay? Because Bible translations don't happen that way. If I am the, manu the original manuscripts, and, and, and let's say your youth guy over here, he is going to be the first English, we're going to say he's the old King James, okay, 1611. He comes to me, right, 
or I go to him. I'm the old manuscripts. Now we got a new uh, English version. And then somewhere over here, we got the revised standard. Because they said, you know what? We don't need all them these and thous. And then we got the new American standard. Is it that they go to him? Or do they come back to me? You see, it's not like telephone. It's I go to him, I go to him, I go to him, I go to him, I go, till we get all the way over here to the ESV. And oh, by, by the way, by now, I've got even more manuscripts. And so it's actually more proof. He says, all right, you got a good history book, so what? Add the next line. I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 1, what's he talking about here when he says, he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. We heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the Holy... He's talking about the transfiguration. Does the Bible talk about miraculous events? Yes. Should Christians be embarrassed or shy away from... Folks, if you're embarrassed about it, then you got a problem with the resurrection and the creation account. Do I think a guy by the name of Jesus really walked on water? Uh, yeah. Do I think there was a guy named Lazarus whose body was decomposing, oozing out? You think about four days of decomposition to where his organ tissue was starting to turn and liquefy. And Jesus brought back life into that. Which, by the way was a foreshadowing of what was about to happen at Calvary and what's going to happen to us one day. Let's add the next line. I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events, notice this, that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. Isaiah. 700 B.C., talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, maybe that's not old enough for you. Maybe, let's go back a thousand years. Psalm 22, thousand years before Jesus walked the earth. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that particular psalm, he says, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a posture. My tongue clings to my jaw, so much so that he says, I thirst, right? You brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. That's interesting because I know that during Jesus' day, Jews considered Gentiles dogs. He says this, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and they stare at me for my garments. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Why, why is that a big deal? Kind of a big deal to Brad because that was actually written down a thousand years before Jesus walked the earth by a man who'd never seen a crucifixion because crucifixion hadn't been invented yet. So why do I choose to believe the Bible? I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. They claim their writings are divine rather than human in origin. At which point our professor says, um, yeah, but you can't rely on it because it was written by men. At which point, I hope our kids are smart enough to go, uh, yeah, what about all these other books? And then that old professor says, yeah, I would believe it if you could prove it to me scientifically. At which point, I start licking my chops. Because by him saying that, that tells me two things. Number one, he doesn't even deserve to be in this, this conversation. 
okay? Number two, he doesn't know enough about the scientific method to even have a discussion on it. Scientific method says in order for something to be real, it's got to be observable, measurable, repeatable. Well, here's a little news flash for you. Historical events are not observable, measurable, repeatable. You, you don't use the scientific method to prove history. You use the evidentiary method. Like if I was going to have you prove in a court of law, did George Washington live? You don't use the scientific method. You use what we use in a courtroom. And so the question is, do we have enough evidence uh, let's see, 14,000 plus artifacts that have been dug out of the ground that directly support the people, places, and events of this book. Yeah, we, we got the evidence. Is it a, a collaboration or does it contradict itself? Folks, this is quite literally the very definition of corroboration. Three languages, three different continents, 16, 15, 1600 years. So why do I choose to believe the Bible? Folks, I'm an evidence guy. And this right here is truth. So let me make sure you understand before you leave today. You can be told by as many intellectually elite people in the world, all oh, smart people believe in evolution. Yeah, well, number one, you can't even tell me how matter and water got here. And number two, this book is truth. I'm going to stick with the truth. Tomorrow morning, we keep going. Um, Mr. Eric, what time we start? 9.30? 9.30. Uh, I don't know where everybody in this room is supposed to be tomorrow morning. I'm not here to steal sheep, but since I don't know where you're supposed to be, just plan on being here, Okay. Um, if you are a preacher for another congregation, just go home, put a little sign on your door saying, hey, we're meeting West Side tomorrow, right here, 9.30. Uh, we would love to have you. 9.30, 10.30 tomorrow morning, we will continue this series. They asked me to put up about our website, because apparently we have run out of most of the books out there. Um, that's a good thing. I will put that up in just a moment. I will stick around for a while. If you guys have got more comments, more questions, I plan on being here. Let me encourage you. Visit our website. I'm not here to sell books, but if there's one that I would tell you to get, there is a book that has a red fingerprint on it called Convicted. A scientist examines the evidence for Christianity. That's the one that's got all of this stuff in it, whether it be dinosaurs, fossil man, ice age, all that kind of good stuff. If you've got a high schooler, college student, somebody who's questioning things, please take a look at it. Uh, I wrote that specifically for folks who need the evidence. So if you will, let's, uh, let's join in prayer and we'll close out our day together. Glorious God and Father, we bow before you this afternoon, acknowledging you as our creator and our sustainer thanking you for life and for breath, thanking you for allowing us just to gather here today to, to study, to open up your word, and to look at the evidence for you. Heavenly Father, in this chaotic world, help us to, to simply be still and to know you. We thank you for the church family that meets here. We ask your blessings on each and every person here. Right now, for the ones who are struggling, the ones who, who have questions, who are skeptical, Heavenly Father, help them to find the truth. Help them to find the answers. Help those in this congregation be ready, be willing to study with them. Be with the parents in this room. Help them to realize the magnitude of the job that they have protecting the souls of their children, teaching them, admonishing them, training them up. Help them to build a wall of protection around them as they are growing and learning. Be with the grandparents in this room. Help them to realize they also play a major role in the spiritual welfare of their grandchildren. Continue to watch over each and every one of us 
Help us to always look to you for guidance and for strength and not to rely on our own understanding. We thank you so much for what you've done for us, for that beautiful gift that you gave us at Calvary. Help us to never, ever take that for granted. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you guys very much.